with some trepidation, Tevia, the milkman, announces to his wife, Golda, that he has given permission for their daughter, Hoddle, to marry her tutor, Perchik. Golda objects vociferously. What? He's poor. He has nothing, absolutely nothing, which is true because Perchik basically is a college student. And in response, Tevia observes that Hoddle and Perchik are deeply in love, and this puts him in a reflective mood, and he asks his wife the question that is really basic to their marriage relationship. Do you love me? At first, Golda can hardly understand the question. Do I what? She says, and then she uh, tries to dismiss Tevia. I won't sing it for you, but it goes like this. <laughs> With our daughters getting married and this trouble in the town, you're upset, you're worn out. Go inside, go lie down. Maybe it's indigestion. Golda says, half to herself, half to Tevia, but the man is persistent. He continues to press the question, forcing his wife to make a declaration. He wants to know if she really does love him. And as she looks back on 25 years of washing Tevia's clothes and cooking Tevia's meals and cleaning his house, raising his children, milking his cow, she reaches the inescapable conclusion that over the years she has learned to love the man that she lives with. If that's not love, she says, what is? Well, I think that touching and humorous exchange from Fiddler on the Roof contains a profoundly biblical insight about love. Love is as love does. Love is not merely an affection of the heart or attitude of the will. It is the action of the life. And so true love comes to expression in practical and often sacrificial deeds of service. Once you understand that, you can find a thousand, maybe a million ways to love Jesus more which I remind you is the goal of this chapel series this year. We started with the first and greatest commandment, which is to love God with everything that we have, including our intellect. And we saw that one of the things that motivates us to love the Lord our God with all our minds is knowing that Jesus loves us with all of his mind. And we have seen that love for Jesus is not something we work up on our own, but something given to us by the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. We've seen that the more we love, uh, the more we are forgiven, the more we love, like that woman who shed her sad tears and poured out her sweet perfume on the feet of Jesus. But how do we show that love? What are, what are some ways that we can love Jesus more? I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 14, to the words of Jesus himself where he tells us that every one of his commandments is another opportunity to live for him in love. This is something that Jesus said on the night that he was betrayed. It was the eve of his crucifixion, and Jesus took his disciples to that upper room where he washed their feet in love, where he gave them the bread and the wine of their first communion. And he promised them that by faith, they would do even greater works than he had done through their prayer to the Father in heaven. And as he said this, Jesus put a very strong emphasis on their obedience to God. Look at John 14 at verse 15. If you love me, he said, here is the test, here is the proof, here is the demonstration, you will keep my commandments. Now, back in his response to the woman at Simon's house who poured her perfume on his feet, Jesus connected love back to forgiveness. And there he emphasized the, effect, the affective or emotional dimension of love, the response, the extravagant response of a forgiven heart. Here he connects love forward to obedience and emphasizes the practical dimension of love, the response of an obedient life. Now, of course, the 
Disciples would not keep God's commandments in their own strength, only by the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit who is sent to fill our lives with the love of God. So as soon as Jesus told his disciples that obedience would be the proof test of their love, he gave them this promise. You can see it there starting in verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. And Jesus goes on to say, you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And with these words, Jesus is reminding us of something that we saw in Romans chapter five, that the Holy Spirit is the power of obedience for the Christian life. This is the way God pours his love into our lives. It's through the presence of his Holy Spirit. Now before the Spirit could come, Jesus had to do his saving work. And so here in this passage, he alludes, though I imagine the disciples hardly understood it, he alludes to his death and resurrection, to the life that would be theirs as a result forever. Yet a little while, he says, verse 19, it's mysterious, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. But it wasn't long before Jesus came back again to this theme of loving obedience. You see it again in verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And then in response to a question from one of the disciples, Jesus repeated himself again, verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and will come to him and we will make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And Jesus emphasizes this word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. But notice here what gets reiterated all the way through the passage. Jesus began in verse 15 by saying, if we love him, we will keep his commandments. In verse 21, he flips that around and says that keeping his commandments is a clear and obvious sign that we love him. And then in verse 23, he goes back to what he said in verse 15 using slightly different words, but it's basically the same thing. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And then in case we miss the point, which hopefully we haven't by now, but in verse 24, he puts the same principle in negative terms. The characteristic of people who do not love Jesus is that they do not do what Jesus says. In every case, there is a clear connection between keeping the commands of Christ and showing affection to Christ, between loving and obeying Jesus, and by repeating himself so many times like this, Jesus practically is putting triple exclamation marks on this principle. He doesn't want us to miss this. One of the best ways for us to show our love for him is simply to do as he says. This is a principle that parents understand well. Believe me, joyful obedience is one of the best ways to a father's or mother's heart. And by contrast, A failure to follow a clear instruction is not just a sign of disrespect, it's a sign of disaffection. I tried to explain this to my daughter recently when I was uh, imploring her with the difference between a clean bunny rabbit cage and an unclean bunny rabbit cage, just like Leviticus, I guess. Uh, I wanted her to understand love is as love does. What an important standard this gives us for love, this connection between love and obedience. It's strange to say, but people sometimes set love in opposition to the law of God. They say, you know, in this situation, we should really do the loving thing, and that sounds good until it becomes apparent that some of the things they are supporting in the name of love are unlawful to Jesus Christ. And then even love itself becomes an excuse to endorse immoral behavior or to refuse to confront somebody's prejudice. Actually, the loving thing to do in somebody's life is to address sin, not ignore it. But sometimes people avoid the issue because to them confrontation doesn't seem like the loving thing to do. Understand that love never stands in opposition to the law of God, but always expresses its deepest principles. You can see this simply by considering the two greatest commands that God has ever given us. Both of them are based on love, love for God and love for neighbor. Or then take those commandments and break them out, separate them into the 10 commandments and all of those commandments are also all about love. 
The first four, all about love for God, love for God's supremacy, don't have any other gods. Love for God's worship, don't use idols. Love for God's name, don't take it in vain. Love, love for God's day, remember the Sabbath. It's all about love for God. And of course, the last six commandments, all about love for other people, starting with our parents. We are called to love people's life and purity and property and reputation and prosperity. All of those thou shalt nots have at the heart of them love for others, which is ultimately an expression of love for God. So understand, true love always stands in conformity to the commands of Christ. The lawful thing is the loving thing. And so when people start making an argument for affirming this practice or that practice on the basis of love, there's a clear standard for us in evaluating that argument is what they are advocating actually in keeping with the commands of Christ. Because if there's one thing he's made clear to us, it is that if we love him, we will keep his commandments. Here is how one old commentator summarized what Jesus said about love in John 14. Love is the foundation of obedience, and obedience is the sure outcome and result of love. Obedience is the certain, the inevitable consequence of true affection for Christ. Or we could put it simply like this, to love is to obey, and to obey is to love. This principle is well illustrated, I think, in famous lines from The Princess Bride. Uh, sorry to get all 1980s on you with the film references. Uh, hopefully you know the story. It's a great film. Nothing gave the fair Princess Buttercup more pleasure than giving orders to Wesley, the farm boy. Polish the saddle, fill these with water, fetch me that pitcher. All Wesley ever said in reply was, as you wish. And then he proceeded to do whatever his princess demanded. And then one day Buttercup realized that his words were more than a courtesy. She discovered to her amazement that when he said, as you wish, what he really meant was, I love you. And this is what we mean or should mean or can mean in response to Jesus whenever we do whatever he tells us to do and do it out of devotion to him. The as you wish of our obedience is the I love you of a life that is offered to Christ. Our goal for this series, my goal, my goal for you, hopefully your goal is to grow in affection for Jesus. And there's an emotional dimension to that as we learned from the woman who anointed Jesus' feet with her tears. But it's interesting, it's striking, I think in a way compelling, that when Jesus told his disciples how to love him, the main thing that he talked about was not a feeling in the heart, but the obedience of a life. Hopefully those two things go together. Jesus says that repeatedly here in John 14, but that's not the only place. This connection between love and obedience, you go on to the next chapter in the discourse on the vine and the branches. Jesus says there, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And John was listening carefully to these things. As the beloved disciple, he learned this lesson well and repeated it in his other writings. Here, his, here is how we know that we have come to know him, John said in his first epistle. If we keep his commandments, whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected. He said something similar near the end of that epistle. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Or again in his second epistle, this is love that we walk according to his commandments. It's not a, a minor teaching of the scripture. It's something repeated for emphasis. And I think something so helpful for us to remember at times when we do not feel especially loving towards Jesus or maybe if we are not even sure what loving Jesus really feels like at all. His main priority for our love is not some particular emotion, and which of course may come and go anyway, but practical obedience to his revealed will, which gives us, I think, a thousand, maybe a million, down-to-earth ways to love Jesus more. And you know, one place to find a pretty good list of those ways is our community covenant. 
Our community covenant, like the covenants that people made in biblical times, is really a promise to love. Love for God acted out in love for others in obedience to God's word. Those are the words of the, the preamble to the community covenant. It's what the covenant's all about. Love for God acted out in love for others in obedience to the word of God. The commitments that we have made to one another and to God are expressions of our affection. When you look at the community covenant that way, it gives you so many different ways to love. The community covenant reminds me that I have made a commitment to careful stewardship of my time and possessions and abilities and opportunities. So whenever I adjust my agenda to serve somebody else rather than myself, whenever I give what I have to the poor, something important to remember in a season of feasting, Whenever I use my mind to wisely and carefully think about a complex issue, all of these things are ways of saying, I love you to Jesus. The covenant is a commitment to participate in the work and worship of the local church. And so when I go to a service, when I sing God's praise, when I listen to the preaching of God's word, when I have opportunities to use my own gifts of, of teaching, as you may have opportunities to do, or maybe it's other gifts. But as long as I am doing these things with a true heart for God, I am telling Jesus, I love you all over again. The covenant calls me to be a person of integrity whose word can be fully trusted. So whenever I follow through on a hard commitment rather than putting it off, whenever I put myself in a true light rather than a better light, this integrity is an expression of love for my Savior. A few weeks ago, I received a letter from one of our neighbors about one of our students. Apparently, a student had lost control of his bike, crashed into a parked car, and left a big scratch across the back. A neighbor sent me the note that the student left on his car, taking responsibility for the accident, giving contact information and asking the neighbor, please, to call so that he could make things right. Now, I'm hopeful that this student will work on his cycling skills. Um, <laughs> he knows who he is, and I know that he knows who he is. <laughs> but the great thing for me and for the neighbor who was writing is that his heart was in the right place, speaking the truth rather than keeping things secret. That is a demonstration of love for Christ. That is what it truly is. Understand that the whole community covenant is a love covenant. So if you go down the list of, of the commitments we make, you'll find numerous ways to love Jesus more. It, it rightly says Christ-like love should be the motive in all decisions, all actions, all relationships. Christ-like love should be the motivation for all of that. Exercising responsible Christian freedom doing honest academic work, treating people's bodies with honor, our own bodies and the bodies of others, seeking mercy and justice for the oppressed, upholding the sanctity of life, promoting biblical principles for marriage, sharing the gospel. This is what love does. These are all ways of loving Jesus more. Too often we think of obedience as a joyless duty or legalistic demand. Jesus wants to liberate us by teaching us to think of obedience as a loving response to his loving grace. Our Father in heaven is not the kind of father who goes around saying, just do as I say all the time, but instead invites us to offer obedience from the heart as a gift of our love. I, I like the way that David Watson says this, God's love language to us is mercy and grace. Our love language to God is loving obedience. A student who wanted to encourage this campus in the grace of God wrote to me about his struggle with perfectionism. Maybe you can relate to what he said. When we focus all of our attention on looking good on the outside, we miss the way God intended our relationship with him and with each other to be. Yes, I struggle, I sin, I have evil thoughts, I judge people, I'm extremely selfish. It's when we can resist these things because we so understand God's love for us and know he wants the best for us, as, which is the reason we shouldn't be sin sinning, not to have a 
a checklist of things not to do. Well, the student was right about that, I think. Obedience to God is not a checklist of things not to do. It's not even a checklist of things to do. It is a loving response to a loving Savior. Clement of Alexandria, who's one of the wisest of the early church writers, said it like this, keeping the divine commandments is the best way to give living expression to our love toward God. The person who knows this best, I think, is Jesus himself. Everything that he did in his life on this earth was a demonstration of his love, love for the Father and also love for us. It was in love that Jesus came down from heaven to be born in poverty and obscurity. It was in love that he served his parents, honoring his father and mother. It was in love that he always did what his heavenly father wanted him to do. I have kept my father's commandments, Jesus said, and abide in his love. He said that in John chapter 15. It's part of the whole context here of, of his message to his disciples. He's not just saying, here's the way I want you to live. He's saying, this is the way that I live, keeping the father's commandments and therefore abiding in his love. It was in love that Jesus would go on to Gethsemane and to Calvary. And the way he prayed to his father in the garden proves that his crucifixion was an act of obedience. He wrestled with the possibility of a wrath-free atonement. But in the end, he said to the father, your will be done. I offer you, father, the, the obedience of my love. And going to that cross, Jesus was keeping covenant with his ancient promise to do everything that needed to be done for our salvation. The cross was the supreme statement of the son's affection for his father and for us. That's the suffering that secures our salvation. But it also means this, that Jesus has firsthand knowledge of the connection between obedience and love. And so when he tells us that to love is to obey, when he says that love is as love does, he is inviting us to follow his loving obedience to the Father. A few months ago, my eight-year-old daughter, Caroline, surprised me by saying, Dad, you remember that day when you were just like Jesus? <laughs> Actually, I didn't remember that day. <laughs> In fact, honestly, a feeling of something like, Grief almost washed over me instantly. I realized there'd never been a day like that in my entire life. But I was still curious. Maybe there was a day when I was a little bit like Jesus. You know, she said with amused exasperation, on your birthday, when you told us that the only thing you wanted was to get us our bunnies. That was just like Jesus, sacrificing yourself for us. Now, actually, um, that's pretty much just what birthdays are like when a father of five turns 46. You, you don't really get to do what you want to do. You're, it's all about doing what everybody else needs done. And in this case, it was actually a promise uh, delivered about two months late. So I, I'm not trying to put myself in a better light here. I'm just putting it in the real light. But maybe Caroline was right a little bit. Maybe what I did was a little bit like Jesus. And if so, I wasn't just saying I love you to my daughters. I was finding another way to say I love you to Jesus, following his example of loving obedience. And that's not, in one sense, so hard to do because there are so many ways to do it. Will you please stand for prayer and for a benediction? So here is our prayer, Father. As people who love you far too little, we ask your forgiveness for that, but we also pray for the powerful work of the Spirit of Jesus to fill our lives with more love, and may the proof of that love, Father, be expressed in lives of obedience. May this be our love for Jesus. And now receive 
this blessing. I probably won't see you again until Thanksgiving. So here's your blessing today. May full thankfulness for all of the blessings of God fill your life. And may the love of Jesus spill over from your life into the lives of others. For Jesus' sake, amen.